So if you're dealing with ileocecal valve dysfunction, in this video I want to help you understand some circumstances that can create this issue and then steps a person can take to improve the situation. So to understand this better, the, the last part of the small intestine here is called the ileum. And then the first part of the large intestine is called the cecum. So this little connection here is called the ileocecal valve. And that's just supposed to be like a one-way valve where digested food can leave the small intestine and then go into the large intestine. But it's supposed to be able to close so that this stuff in the large intestine, all this waste is supposed to be removed and all the bacteria that are supposed to exist in this large intestine don't back up back into the small intestine. That would create trouble. So it should be a one-way valve that opens so food can go back in here and then it closes so that things are not moving back into the small intestine. But some things can go wrong and then people are gonna be like, ah man, you got a busted ileocecal valve. You gotta take it to the shop and get that fixed. But that's not really how it works. And the symptoms that can come up can really vary from person to person. Some people call this like the great mimicker just because it can create all this digestive distress and symptoms, but it can also create pain in other areas like your neck and your back and things like that. So. The confusion can come from where is, what's creating this? What's happening? And a lot of people will just say, oh, well, you can just find where that ileocecal valve is in between your belly button and your, you know, hip bone and, you know, massage it a little bit. And just like push that button and it's all going to be great. And this actually really can create some relief for some people who are having a lot of discomfort if it's like, especially if it's stuck closed and things are not moving the way that they should. So a person can massage that area and find some relief, but you're not really fixing the problem. We want to understand the underlying issues that can really create this dysfunction. So just keep in mind that I'm not a doctor. I'm not giving anybody medical advice. I'm just a professional comic turned nutrition author because when I lost my voice for eight years, 23 different doctors couldn't help me figure that out. And I had to learn how to dig for my own answers. So now I teach health professionals how to help their clients fix the actual underlying causes of issues instead of just covering up the symptoms. So I'm going to share some studies with you here today. It's okay if I stand in front of these. I'll make them big so you can see them. And I'm going to put the links of these studies in the description below this video so you can dig further into this if you want to kind of check out some of these other things. But the first thing that we want to understand is the connection between this ileocecal valve dysfunction and SIBO, or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So let's look at this study here on ileocecal valve dysfunction and small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And they found in this study by looking to see does a person appear to have a SIBO issue by doing breath testing and such, and then how is their valve working? They call it the pressure of that valve kind of indicates whether it has the ability to open and close correctly. And they found that when someone tested positive for SIBO, that they usually had problems with the pressure with this ileocecal valve. So they were saying, well, yeah, if this valve isn't closing correctly, then this bacteria is going to move back into the small intestine and create that small intestinal bacterial overgrowth issue. So that can be a possibility that we need to understand a little bit. But if we go further and we look at this study on a prospective evaluation of ileocecal valve dysfunction and intestinal motility derangements in small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, they looked at some other factors beyond just did the person have SIBO. They were also looking at factors of like the bowel transit time through that small intestine along with the pH of different areas of that gastrointestinal tract. And you probably heard us talk in other videos like about slow motility and stuff about how the pH of this intestinal tract is very important and can dictate the speed at which things move through that system. So in this summary I found for this study, they said 30 patients with suspected SIBO were tested for their ability to move food through the intestines. Ileocecal junction pressure, which is the ability for that valve to open and close properly and at the right times small bowel transit time, and regional gastrointestinal pH. So their conclusion was patients with SIBO have significantly lower ileocecal junction pressure. The valve is not opening and closing when it should. Prolonged small bowel transit time and a higher gastrointestinal pH compared to those without SIBO. So they were saying that things took longer to move through here when somebody had SIBO. The pressure on this valve was not as effective and it was a higher pH. It was more alkaline. 
And we've talked in a lot of videos that if everything moving through here is way too acidic, that it can move really quick because the body's like, hey, this acidity is going to digest a hole right through the intestinal tract. I'm going to kind of bring all the water I can and rush everything through so it doesn't do that and a person can have diarrhea. That's one possible cause of diarrhea. But if things are not acidic enough, if there's maybe not enough acid in the stomach, then it's harder for that food to be broken down so that we can access the nutrients in that food. So it appears that things will move at a slower pace to kind of give the body more time to try to access the nutrients within the food that we're eating. So the pH of all of this is very important as to how things are going to move and function correctly. So when I asked Google, can the pH of this intestinal tract affect the ability for this ileocecal valve to function correctly, it says, yeah, patients with SIBO consistently exhibit higher intralumial pH in their small intestine. And this could be because a lot of times when there's an overgrowth, either in the stomach or the small intestine, a lot of those bacteria can put out alkaline waste products. So that can alkalize that environment and raise the pH. And it went on to say this, this higher pH is associated with significantly lower ileocecal junction pressure, which is the measure of the valve's ability to function. Higher small bowel pH also correlates with prolonged bowel transit time. And the combination of prolonged transit and high pH creates a less hostile environment for bacterial overgrowth and the impaired valve may further contribute to the cycle. So it appears that when things are moving slower and there's more alkaline, there's some people that feel like, well, undigested food or constipation has the ability to block this valve from working correctly. And so when there's SIBO here and things are moving slower, that's when we see constipation a lot. We see it a lot when there's an alkaline situation, everything's moving really slow because then with that slow movement, that stool gets more dry and more hard and more difficult to move. Now, this is not the only cause of constipation. There's other causes that we talk about a lot, but when we're seeing these possibilities that have the ability to restrict this from working correctly, lining up with this, then we really want to pay attention to this transit time and the pH. And when we're looking at the pH here, yes, an overgrowth has the ability to do that, but in a lot of cases, it has to do with a lack of stomach acid. It's very common for someone not to be making enough stomach acid today for a wide variety of reasons. Millions of people turn off stomach acid on a daily basis on purpose. But when there's not enough stomach acid there to really acidify our food so that we can break it down and get the nutrients out of that food, then everything moving through the system is going to be more on that alkaline side. That initial acid was not there to get that pH into a range where it's going to move at an appropriate pace. Now, another thing we need to understand is that that acid doesn't just help us acidify the food so that we can break it down. It's also the barrier to this whole digestive tract. So when varmints come in on the food that we're eating, they're supposed to die in an acid bath. And when someone isn't making enough hydrochloric acid or HCL, that stomach acid in the stomach, then the varmints come in, they're like, oh, this is nice, let's set up camp here. And they raise their kids and they create some type of overgrowth in the stomach and they can move down and also have an overgrowth here in the small intestine. So that we can see that a problem with this SIBO issue could be coming from things backing up from the large intestine where the bacteria is supposed to be, or it could be from all this bacteria coming in because the front door is open. And when we're looking at this ileocecal valve functioning correctly, we also need to understand that hormones are involved in this whole digestive process. In other videos, we've talked about things like cholecystokinin and secretin. And what I really want to talk about here today is what's called gastrin. And gastrin in the stomach is released when food comes in. It's food coming in that kind of creates that pressure that kind of tells gastrin to be released. And then the gastrin tells the stomach to create that hydrochloric acid. But what we need to understand is that gastrin is also affected by changes in pH. So the stomach is this acidic environment, but when we put food in there, that changes the pH because the food is more on the alkaline side. It's not like battery acid. We're not eating battery acid like the acidity in the stomach. So it's going to raise that pH some, and that pH going up signals gastrin to be released and then tell the stomach to make more acid so that we can acidify our food. So to understand how this might become a problem, let's look at this study here on predictors of gastrin elevation following proton pump inhibition.
inhibitor therapy, and they found that the longer a person used a proton pump inhibitor, or a PPI, which is really just a medication that we use to turn off stomach acid to relieve an acid reflux symptom of acid coming back up, oh, it's burning me, so I'm just going to turn off that acid so I don't have that burning symptom. So this study showed that the longer a person used that, the greater the odds that they were going to have elevated gastrin levels. And also if a person was female, then those odds went up a little bit higher as well. And this makes sense because if we're turning off stomach acid, then that stomach is going to be more on the alkaline side, which is going to signal the body to release gastrin. Now what we want to understand about gastrin is that it doesn't just signal the stomach to make stomach acid, it also goes through the circulatory system so that it can come down here and signal this lower part of the small intestine, the ileum, to have more motility. Hey, let's start moving things through and let's open up this valve so that this food can move into the large intestine. And people think it does that because, well, food's coming in, so we need to move through this other stuff. We need to move it out so we can make room for this stuff that just came in. So gastrin is kind of being released to activate the stomach acid, but also come down here and tell this, hey, let's move this stuff out. Let's get this into the colon here so that we make room for this stuff that just came in. But if gastrin is really elevated all the time because we turned off stomach acid or because the body doesn't have the ability to produce stomach acid, there's other reasons beyond just taking a PPI that someone might not be able to make stomach acid. They could be really stressed where the body can't move into the parasympathetic rest and digest side of the autonomic nervous system where it needs to be to be able to produce that hydrochloric acid. Maybe they don't have enough nutrients uh, the body needs nutrients to be able to make that hydrochloric acid. So there's a lot of reasons that the stomach might not be making enough acid, but when it does, it's going to elevate that gastrin level because the gastrin is just like, oh, it's too alkaline here. Gastrin's got to go high to tell it to make stomach acid. But if something's blocking that ability, the body's just going to keep making that gastrin. So if it's doing that, is that gastrin at a higher level constantly signaling this ileocecal valve to open up? And if it does, if it's staying open too much, is all this stuff backing up and really magnifying a SIBO issue. So if that's the case, with a lack of acid, we're letting the bad guys in come in this direction. But if this gastrin is going too high too often and signaling this valve to open up too often, are things backing up into there? And so that's why I don't view it. Some people are going to view like, oh, if you have constipation, your ileocecal valve is stuck closed. And if you have diarrhea, it's because that valve is stuck open and everything's just moving through. And I just don't view it that way because if it is stuck open and things are backing up and all this you know, bacteria is creating an alkaline environment, that really has the ability to slow things down for some people. Now, some people with an overgrowth will have diarrhea because the body's like, hey, get all these bad guys out of here. Almost like as if you had a food poisoning issue, but maybe at a lower intensity. So we see both issues when there's overgrowth and issues. There's ways that a person can be really constipated and ways that a person can really have diarrhea. There's other factors involved into whether that's going to be the case, not just whether an ileocecal valve is stuck closed or open. So when there's not enough stomach acid here, that's called hypochlorhydria. So let's look at this study here on mealtime supplementation with betaine HCL for functional hypochlorhydria. And I've talked about this study in other videos, and they basically used a PPI to turn off stomach acid for these individuals in the study to create hypochlorhydria. And then they saw all the common symptoms that come up with low stomach acid, you know, bloating and constipation and acid reflux. And yeah, acid reflux is caused by a lack of stomach acid. Kind of like this valve down here that we're talking about, this ileocecal valve, there's also a lower esophageal sphincter right here at the bottom of the esophagus, and that's really what this valve is. It's not a valve that opens, it's like a sphincter. And this valve up here is triggered by stomach acid. So if someone just has a small amount of acid, it's not enough to trigger that valve to close, then the small amount will go up and create that reflux symptom. But if they increase the amount of acid, enough to trigger this valve to close, then the reflux stop, but most people just turn off acid altogether. So in this study, they did that. They turned off the acid, they saw all the symptoms that come about that are common with low stomach acid, and then they supplemented with a supplemental form of HCL called betaine HCL capsules. And when they supplemented with that HCL, 
then they saw that all of those symptoms improved. So even when that acid was turned off, they found that they could improve all of these issues and improve the way digestion works by supplementing with that acid. So when we're looking to improve ileocecal valve function, it seems like you want to get away from the common things that are seen when there is trouble. The common things are a SIBO issue, a higher pH in this intestinal tract, and a slower transit time. So an effective step that we see to improve those circumstances is to improve the stomach acid. If stomach acid is low, that has to be fixed to be able to acidify the food so that it can move through at an appropriate pace. We need to acidify the stomach to close the front door so that we're not bringing in all these bad guys. So that could be a very important first step is supplementing with betaine HCL. You really want to know how to do this the right way. I'm not going to go deep into that in this video, but my book, Kick Your Fat in the Nuts, chapters three and four, kind of walk you through figuring out which aspects of digestion are not working correctly and steps you can take to fix those. And that teaches you how to use that betaine HCL the right way. You want to know how to use it the right way. And the book is available on Amazon, but I'll put a link in the description below where you can get the whole thing totally for free. And then you can just jump to chapters three and four, and that'll kind of walk you through figuring out those things. But when someone has this issue and all the discomforts that go along with that, they need to understand that it's very common to have troubles when they first start supplementing with HCL. If there's a major overgrowth in the stomach and you put acid in there and the overgrowth has all this alkaline waste in there, then those opposite pHs colliding kind of creates like this fizzy mess in the stomach where it really shouldn't be happening like that. And that can create magnifying bloating, magnified reflux, a lot of symptoms like nausea and things. So a person wants to understand they may need to take steps to reduce a bacterial overgrowth in the stomach and the small intestine as they're introducing those acids to reduce the odds of some of those symptoms. And I'll put a link in the description below for our video on possible troubles when first starting betaine HCL to understand what to look out for and ways to, to get around that. But when that's the case, a big step is taking steps to reduce an overgrowth. And we have other videos that talk about ways to get rid of bacteria in the stomach and get rid of bacteria in the small intestine and I'll link to those below. But it really becomes about allowing the body to work the way that it's supposed to. All these hormones and all these things, they're all triggered by this stomach acid here. This stomach acid is telling them, okay, I'm not, there's not enough acid. We need to make more of these hormones. Okay, now it's acidic. We can turn those hormones off. There's other hormones that happen down here that signal other things to neutralize the acids as they're leaving the stomach. All those things have to work together. And if we decide just to shut off part of it, well, why would we expect other parts to work correctly? We really need to allow each step to work the way that it's supposed to work. But the main thing is we don't want this to be signaled to be open all the time and we don't want everything here to be so alkaline or so constipated and backed up that it can't open at all. We want everything working like it should. So I hope that gives you some insights into how to improve this situation. And right now, if you want to learn more about wiping out bacteria in these different areas, you can jump over and check out our video on how to wipe out bad bacteria in the stomach or how to fix SIBO. I can't wait to hear about your results.